today we're going to consider what did the Thermidorians do to bring about the end of the terror and what challenges did they face. So we'll be considering the Thermidorian reaction of mid-1794 following the period of the fall of Robespierre and we'll be considering what this period was about politically, socially, culturally and we'll be trying to make some kind of conclusions. So we're hopefully going to identify the key aspects of the Thermidorian reaction and to try to evaluate the challenges faced by this new regime. So historians have described Thermidor in three possible ways. Arguably a period of moderation, a period where the vilest, most extreme political tendencies of the terror were attenuated and made more moderate. Some historians actually describe it as a period of regression, certainly when it comes to popular democracy, uptake in the political process, and the kind of civil rights which were proclaimed by uh, the revolutionary government, the National Convention of 1793, although not necessarily implemented, we're going to see a more of a return to the earlier period of the revolution, 1789 to 1791. And that brings us to the final point. Many historians agree that the Thermidorian reaction was really a period of bourgeois revolution, a period where the middle class the less radical uh, owners of property, they were the ones who controlled the flow of political action. So before we go any further, I think it's worth recapping um, the impact of the terror. And as you can see here from um, this, this pie chart, it was actually the third estate, the peasants and the bourgeoisie. Obviously, this is a huge heterogeneous social group containing people from, you know, lowly farmhands all the way up to lawyers and doctors and teachers and professionals. Uh, but it was this group, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, considering they constituted the majority, that actually suffered the most during the terror. And I guess this really go against the popular narrative that the terror was very much uh, inflicted on the nobility. There's this age-old picture that comes into people's minds when they think of the terror, and that is the Aristo getting his head chopped off. That simply wasn't the case. The majority of people who fell foul of the Committee of Public Safety and the Revolutionary Tribunal were actually normal people. They were peasants in the rural areas, but of course members of the bourgeoisie too in the more urban areas. So the coup of Thermidor occurred from the 26th to the 28th of July 1794 with the majority of the action actually taking place on the 27th of July in the evening thereof. So the end execution of Robespierre signified a rejection of government by terror. These events are known as the coup of Thermidor, obviously named after that period of the French revolutionary calendar which had been implemented by this radical Montenard government. Um, there was a popular outburst of relief when Robespierre was executed. Of course, we've seen years, well, I guess a year now, of popular reprisal uh, against those that were deemed counter-revolutionary. So with Robespierre gone, um, we usher in this new period, hopefully anyway, of, of political rationalisation and moderation. But we'll see whether that actually is achieved. One uh, commentator su suggested that people were hugging each other in the street and at places of entertainment. And they were so surprised to find themselves still alive and their joy almost turned into a frenzy. I guess that popular attitude is perhaps understandable when you consider how many people did die during the reign of terror. Um, the official statistics give about 40,000 people, but you've got to remember these are recorded deaths, usually by guillotine. Far more people died um, in the Vendée, within the Chouan revolt in um, the northwest of France, and of course in the Federalist revolts. And the vast majority of people were killed, usually in those areas, the rural uprisings. The siege of Toulon is another example. Um, I think some more... Uh, more um, I guess, realistic estimates actually placed the death toll at about 200,000 during the terror. So some significant mortality during this period. The first question that we need to answer is this. Who were the Thermidorians? Well, it's not an easy answer. The Thermidorians were actually quite a heterogeneous group. They weren't particularly united. They came from a variety of different backgrounds. The easiest way of defining them are just those that helped to overthrow Robespierre. 
and ushered in this new period, which will last 1794 to 95, but will go on to form the period of the Directory, which we'll, we'll consider next, next time round. So they actually comprised of people from the committees. So there were actually people from the Committee of Public Safety that served as Thermidorians and actually helped to plot and conspire against Robespierre within the committee itself. Many of them were ex-terrorists, members of the Montinar, members of the National Convention. But actually, I guess the majority of them were drawn from the plain, the political independence in the middle. And as such, the Thermidorians were largely politically moderate. The vast majority of them were also bourgeois. They weren't drawn from the radical rabid saint culotte They weren't really drawn from the commune. These were, by and large, the same kinds of men that had instituted the revolution um, in 1789. Um, the plain, obviously, are now going to be in control following the demise of the, the radical Montanar and following the period of, of Robespierre's control and, of course, the Girondin before him. But the plain, again, you need to understand, are a mixed group. They aren't a coherent political body. The idea of parties um, is a fairly anachronistic term here. It doesn't really apply to this period, but I guess even you know the Ebetists, the Indulgence, the um, the Montanar that we have studied, they were more coherent than the Plain. The Plain was largely just an independent grouping. The thing that they do have in common is that they don't really want to see a return of the monarchy, not even a constitutional one. So they are Republicans by and large, just not the kind of rabid leftist, ultra leftist Republicans that we've been used to seeing under the Terror. And that leads to the next point, that they dislike the Jacobins. They feel that the Jacobins had given too much power to the Sankalot. Um, and also they feared, uh, being businessmen largely, the Jacobins' reliance on price controls, the general maximum. They were free market. The plain at this point, I guess, actually have more in common with the physiocrats of the early um, French Revolution. Uh, than they do with any other kind of attempt at economic change since then. To summarise, really, the Thermidorians have uh, one real thing in common, that is a suspicion of popular democracy, uh, a, a hatred of the terror and a, a need to stop it, and also a fear of the continued anarchy of the provinces, which of course has distinguished the period 1793 to 1794 with some of those uprisings that we've considered and thought about before. So here are some examples of leading or prominent Thermidorians, and I hope what you'll get from this is that they are a very diverse group. I'll start with Talion on the left-hand side. So Talion was actually an extreme Montanar to begin with. He had been a devotee of Marat, a keen supporter of Marat uh, throughout 1793, particularly during his trial. Um, he was also a member of the commune under Danton in late 1792, the insurrectionary commune, which had filled that temporary political vacuum after the uh, August Genet, which overthrew Louis on the 10th of August 1792. Talion, like many of the other um, Thermidorians, was actually a representative, uh, representative on mission. Uh, he was sent to Bordeaux and he was known for his pretty extreme methods, I guess, just like many of the other representatives on mission. Um, Jean-Baptiste Carrière, possibly the most famous example, his drownings of innocent women and priests, the Noyades, are, uh, of course, a, a major part of, of the Federalist revolts uh, and the Vendée the retribution in the Vendée. Um, by the start of 1794, though, Talion had actually become much more moderate, and a lot of people chalk this up to his new wife, who was actually an ex-aristocrat and shared many sympathies with the Omegre, uh, absolutely loathed Robespierre, absolutely hated the direction that the French Revolution was going in, and many, like I have said, suggest that Talion was very much influenced by uh, his new wife. Um, who we will actually go on and look at in a further section. Um, Robespierre responded to Talion's more moder moderate um, reforms in charge of Bordeaux by recalling him. And he actually later went on to arrest his wife, Teresa, 
um, which of course created a huge rift uh, between Talion and Robespierre and further motivated Talion towards revenge and overthrow of, of the uh, CPS. Um, so he's just one example. Another example is Joseph Fouché, who we've mentioned before, an ultra-leftist, a rabid, um, militant uh, Montenegro. Uh, he was personally responsible for the mass shootings in Lyon. Uh, and one source says that every day, batch after batch of bankers, scholars, aristocrats, priests, nuns and wealthy merchants and their wives, mistresses and children were taken from the city jails to Brotteaux Field, tied to stakes and dispatched by firing squads or mobs. So Fouché, um, you know, it was was very much in charge of this ultra violent, ultra, um, I guess, unnecessary uh, reprisals. Uh, in the Federalist Revolts, just like Talion and just like some of the others. Um, Fouché, as you know, was also um, very much a leader of the de-Christianisation movement. And they they obviously um, locked heads with Robespierre and Saint-Just because they didn't believe in de-Christianisation. They believed that um, religion actually plays an important role in controlling the people. Um, and I guess the real moment of schism between Joseph Fouché, who of course belongs to the Montenard, and uh, Robespierre is after the Festival of the Supreme Being, where Robespierre uh, parades and gallivants around as this, you know, um, supreme being, this figure of un untold wisdom who would direct the revolution. Fouché, I guess, from this point onwards, thinks that the power is going to Robespierre's head and uh, starts to conspire against him alongside others. It's, of course, noted that Fouché was probably one of the men on Robespierre's quote-unquote list, which he failed to produce, of suspected counter-revolutionaries, and that was probably owing to their divide over religion. Um, Fouché, a bit of a slippery sword, actually went on to become a prominent minister under Napoleon, serving in all of the governments from this point onwards, uh, very slick, but very, um, very, very dubious political operator. Louis-Marie Stanislas uh, Ferrand, uh, another really prominent uh, Thermidorian, was a radical journalist, I guess, just like the late Marat. Uh, he was elected to the National Convention. He was also a representative on mission. Um, his his paper, the, the Speaker of the People, or the Orator de Pup, uh, became the mouthpiece of the anti-Jacobin movement. Uh, and this guy goes on to arrest people like Carrière, uh, who we've talked about, and uh, Fouquier Timva, uh, who was himself one of the leaders of the Revolutionary Tribunal, a very important individual. And the final person that I'll just quickly mention is Paul Barat, who will go on to become an incredibly influential politician in the next period, the Directory of 1795 to 1799. Paul Barat, different to these three other men in that he was a member of the plane, he was a political moderate, he was actually a nobleman originally, which is quite rare by this point that they've still survived. Um, but nevertheless, he's not a conservative nobleman. He was never a monarchien or a member of the Noir. He was, he was always a revolutionary from the get-go. And he actually joined the Jacobin Club early on, but I guess became more estranged from the Jacobin movement as it slipped further towards rabid leftist, uh, sans-culotte appeasing um, republicanism. He was never really a Montanar, he was a Jacobin. You need to understand the distinction between that. Um, and so as a result of that, I guess he stayed where the Jacobins were as the club drifted to the left and um, ended up associating himself with the plane during the terror, kept his head down, uh, but would obviously be a, a key figure in the Thermidorian reaction. So the Thermidorian reaction um, occurs, as we've already said, on the evening, really, of the 27th of July, 1794. And just to kind of run you through the events, it's a, it's a very eventful evening, as you can imagine. Saint-Just uh, was actually in the midst of reading a report to the Committee of Public Safety when he was interrupted by Jean uh, Lambert Talion, the guy on the left that we've just been talking about, um, who impugned Saint-Just. He got up and made a very heated speech and went on to denounce the tyranny of Robespierre. And then suddenly in this room of 12, two other individuals stand up following Talion's uh, vitriolic repudiation of Robespierre. Bilal Varane and also Colotte de Bois 
both stand up at this point attacking uh, Robespierre and uh, Saint-Just. Robespierre, of course, leaps to the defence of Saint-Just, his right-hand man, and himself, and cries went up and down the room of down with the tyrant, arrest him. Robespierre and his supporters uh, escape the room, they run away, and they gather at the Hôtel de Ville, of course, the the home, the base of the Paris Commune and the radical revolution. Um, meanwhile, the convention, um, now under the kind of auspices of Talion, Colotte de Bois, and these men that we've just mentioned, use this opportunity to attack Robespierre publicly. They denounce him and they declare Robespierre um, sans, sans juste coutant, all of the men that are in that circle, Le Bas, these men are all declared outlaws, they're fugitives, um, and that they could be executed within 24 hours without a trial under the law of 22 Parial. They, they are now, ironically, the counter-revolutionaries, despite leading the, the terror for so long. Um, and they send a force to arrest Robespierre and his cronies at the Paris Commune, so they march across the city as they came Robespierre's brother, Augustine, actually leaps out the window in an escape attempt but breaks both of his legs and was arrested. Le Bar then commits suicide, shoots himself in the face. Couton, the famous deputy in the wheelchair, the mechan one of the world's first mechanical wheelchairs, hurls himself down the bottom of some stairs, uh, I guess in, a, in an attempt as well to take his life, uh, but was was captured. And Robespierre meets, I guess, the grisliest or the grisliest attempt of all. He tries to shoot himself in the face, uh, misses where he was aiming for, um, shoots his jaw off, it's shattered, and is arrested. And that's effectively the coup of Fermidor. That's how it plays out. The following day, the 28th of July, 1794, um, Robespierre, Saint-Just uh, and Couton are all executed along with 21 others. So that is the coup of Thermidor. And when these Thermidorians now gain control, the first thing that they go about doing is unravelling the machinery of terror. So we've got all of these cogs uh, on the right-hand side, the cogs which literally make up the machine of terror. So the convention was initially successful with dismantling the terror. Between 1794 and the 31st of May 1795, the convention did the following. They abolished the Revolutionary Tribunal, the law court whose job it was to uh, prosecute, to try and prosecute suspects um, and counter-revolutionaries. Um, this follows the execution of a further 63 people, including some who had been leading terrorists, um, it released all suspects from prison. It repealed the law of Prairial and closed down the Jacobin Club. So the Jacobin Club is outlawed, it's made illegal, it's driven underground. The commune is abolished in Paris. So this hugely significant local governmental organisation, which at various points has filled political vacuums and actually ruled um, over France, this, this body which has been super radical, really since 1791 because of its lack of voting restrictions it's totally infiltrated by the saint culotte from 1795 onwards it ceases to exist it's been completely stripped of its power um and it's determined to gain control of the committees the the thermidorians know that they have to strangle the life out of these two committees. So they decree that 25% of the members of the two committees be changed each month. And of course, that is an attempt to stop any individual like Robespierre from ever gaining too much authority or control again. Some other things that happen, um, the CPS and the CGS were obviously the only two committees during the terror we start to see the creation of lots of other committees. There are 16 in total, including the CPS and CGS. And they are all tasked with different areas of the French state. And obviously, again, that is to stop any one committee gaining too much power. We looked at the law of Freemaire in December 1793, which enabled the CPS to almost become this de facto 
dictatorial revolutionary government. The whole point of Thermidor is to stop that from happening again. So not only do we see 25% of the members of the committees changed every month to stop an individual from rising to power, we actually see the creation of new committees to stop any one committee gaining power. And the CPS, this once hugely powerful organisation, is relegated to a fairly perfunctory role in the French state. It only really has power over diplomacy, military operations and war materials going from here on in. It certainly doesn't have the power to legislate for all of France. Finally, power in local government passed to property owners. In many senses, this resembled the constitutional government under the Legislative Assembly. So a really good way to think about this is the Thermidorians turning back the clock three years and going back to this period of bourgeois revolution where only the propertied, only the moderate um, revolutionaries hold the keys to power. This brings us to the White Terror, which is... I think a really interesting development following the Thermidorian reaction and kind of linked to it, kind of subsidiary. And this is a development which is not just political, but also cultural, social as well. So hostility towards Robespierre did not just vanish with his execution, and it did not just vanish with the destruction of the machinery of terror. Instead, the people decided to blame those who were involved with Robespierre in any way, namely the many members of the Jacobin Club, their supporters and individuals suspected of being past Montanar. So these men who I guess kind of go into hiding following the Thermidorian Revolution, they don't get away with it. They become the targets of this next wave of terror, which from this point onwards will be called the White Terror. Very different from the state-sponsored terror of 1793 to 1794, not to be confused with Robespierre's terror. Uh, this happened on a smaller scale, but was very interesting. So what actually happened was groups across uh, France, but particularly in Paris, took up the mantle of victimising, abusing, beating up, but also murdering these men that were once upon a time associated with the terror and associated with Robespierre. And this gang, for want of a better word, known as the Muscadins, and you can see a picture of two Muscadin on the right hand side and they're called muscadins because of the cologne the aftershave that they wear on their neck scarves and one thing that you can probably see and tell from this this painting of two muscadins strolling the streets of paris is their fashion their dress you know they are very much abandoning the um the impoverished look of the saint culotte and instead embracing the and more aristocratic style they're very dandyish, they're very well dressed, and they're known for carrying these canes, symbols again of aristocracy and wealth in society. But of course, they use these canes to beat up old Saint Culotte and members of the Montenar faction. Supposedly organised by the politician and journalist uh, Ferrand, so the man we mentioned earlier um, here. On. They were supposedly organised by him. In reality, they probably um, evolved quite organically, but they eventually numbered some 2,000 to 3,000. So if you almost think of them as a new wave of revolutionaries that are anti saint -Colot, that is a good way of thinking about them. Um, they actually, in fact, seem to have mostly consisted of the lower middle classes. They were the sons, for example, of minor, minor officials and small shopkeepers. They were actually quietly encouraged by the Thermidorians. It's not that the Thermidorians had no role in, uh, in, in dictating what the Muscadin were doing. They were quietly encouraged to go out and beat up and, you know, uh, the, the old, the old um, terrorists. And they were told effectively that the government, the police forces, the National Guard would turn the other eye. Out. Um, the regime excluded the remaining Montanar as well. So many of them obviously targeted, beaten up by the Muscadin. Others were actually excluded um, from power. Um, even those who had actually joined in the coup of Thermidor. So for example, Bilal Varane, Claude de Bois, at this point, these two men are basically shut off. They will later be deported as well. Kind of initial Thermidorian group, which consisted not only of moderates, but also the um, kind of terrorists that were 
annoyed with Robespierre or had found a reason to uh, oppose him, they, from this point onwards, would be excluded from power and the Thermidorians kind of become a more centrist, moderate, bourgeois faction. Um, Another thing that I just want to quickly talk about are some of the social movements which emerge alongside the Muscadins, this this kind of gang. We start to see um, a massive shift in dress sense, in in design, in art, and it becomes quote-unquote cool or permissible or acceptable to adopt the old aristocratic styles again to show that you weren't a jacobin to show that you were you were opposed to the terror a way of showing that a way of politically augmenting that into your identity was to actually dress up um, in these more aristocratic styles and you see some examples here on the left and the right two movements i want to talk about are the incroyable and the uh, mavioce Okay, so the Incroyab, uh, translated to kind of Incredibles, the Unbelievables, and uh, the Mervelousse, the Marvellous Women. These were, um, this was a fashionable aristocratic subculture, particularly in Paris. Um, very effete, very decadent, very self-indulgent. The whole point was obviously, like I've said, to disassociate themselves with the hungry poor that were very much in vogue during the, the terror, very much seen to be the height of uh, virtue. Um, that is now uncool, that is now bad. We need to disassociate ourselves with them. Um, I think it's really interesting as well that the picture here, Teresa Talion, this is Talion's wife that we mentioned earlier. She becomes the figurehead of this uh, incroyable uh, Mervelosse movement. And she's seen here in neoclassical aristocratic style, almost dressed up like a, a Greek um, dignitary. Um, and that was very deliberate, of course. So these two social movements, the incroyable, the Mervelosse, they become pretty prominent during this period 1794 to 1795 during the white terror the jeunesse dorée are largely found outside of paris they're, they're more like a provincial version of the the muscadin gang the kinds of things that they do they attack the saint colot and the jacobins in the streets they fell the trees of liberty they trample on the tricolor in the street they force the closure of pro jacobin newspapers they do all of these kinds of things one really, really famous example is um, a group of Muscadin, a gang, um, marching down the Rue Fidel, uh, which was a, a famous street in Paris, which saw um, a decoration after 1793 with lots of busts of Marat. Of course, Marat at that point was very much seen as a figurehead, a martyr of the French Revolution. And what they would do is they would go down the Rue Fabu and they would smash these busts of Marat, shouting down with Marat, down with the terror, down with Robespierre. Some other groups uh, like the Jeunesse Doré, like the Muscadins, are uh, the Companies of Jesus in Lyon and the Companies of the Sun in Nîmes. So this is a French-wide movement. It's not just located in Paris. It's just in Paris that, of course, we see the, the extremities, the extremes of this uh, this movement. Okay, so some other things to discuss when thinking about the Thermidorian reaction um, is the ongoing economic crisis, which is never solved, which the Thermidorians do try to um, do try to do something about, but ultimately fail uh, in doing. So the Thermidorians, of course, wanted to get rid of the price controls uh, established by Robespierre to appease the saint -Colot. They, as I've already said, are most closely aligned to the physiocrats of the early French Revolution. They believe in free trade. And of course, as the factory owners, as the producers, the manufacturers, it's in their best interests to have that free trade. They don't want to have fixed prices. They don't want to pay fixed wages. They don't want to have trade stunted. Uh, by these arbitrary government measures. So they want to get rid of these price controls. But in getting rid of these price controls, this actually leads to a massive drop in the value of the assignat and huge inflation. Um, of course, the grain uh, producers, the farmers, the, the big landowners at this point don't want to sell their grain anymore. Uh, they keep hold of it. And this, of course, causes another problem, which is the flow of food into the into the cities. 
And this situation was made worse by a poor harvest, which strikes just in the midst of this in the summer of 1794, leading to increased grain shortages. Then following the poor harvest in the summer of 1794, we see an unprecedented severe winter, um, which lasts obviously from late 1794 through to the spring of 1795, meaning that rivers actually freeze, stopping canal transport, stopping the transportation of grain, but also uh, manufactured goods, and factories actually close down as a result of this. So I guess the the ab abolition of price controls compounded uh, and compiled and exacerbated by these uh, climatic conditions create this huge economic disaster in 1794. Uh, Riol, who is a publisher um, during the period, describes the situation thus. The flour intended for Paris is stopped on the way and stolen by citizens, even hungrier, no doubt, than ourselves. Yet there is no lack of corn anywhere. So how did the directory respond to this economic crisis? Well, it's a terrible, terrible response. They respond much like the Weimar government um, after the inflationary crisis of 1923 by quantitative easing, um, in other words, printing more money. And this is what happens. By printing more money, the assignat collapses. The value of the assignat just falls through the floor. In 1794, before the maximum was abolished, the assignat was worth 34% of its 1790 value. So it had been steadily decreasing anyway. But you see it um, just fall off a cliff here. It dropped to 8% of its value in April 1795 and 4% of its value in 1795. So clearly there is a severe uh, economic crisis occurring during this point. It leads, this economic crisis, of course, leads to political issues, uh, which I'm going to go on and talk about now. Three big crises in 1795. But before we get there, I think it's important to understand what's going on with the royalists. We start to see a bit of a resurgency in royalism during this period. Um, Louis XVI, who of course has been dead for two years by 1795, um, his title is of course passed on to his son, Louis XVII, who actually had been kept in prison since August 1792. And unfortunately, he dies in prison at the age of 10. We don't know why, possibly from tuberculosis, but certainly from neglect. Um, and this left Louis's two younger brothers in line to the throne, uh, Louis Comte de Provence and Louis Comte d'Artois. And it would be the Comte de Provence, the older of his younger brothers, that actually becomes next in line to the throne. And actually, he will go on to become King Louis XVIII at the end of our course in, 17, in 1814 and later in 1815 to 1824. So he actually becomes the next Bourbon on the throne. But the important thing to understand is that from afar, these two younger brothers are making the most of a bad situation. They are calling out to the people of France, look, this Thermidorian government is no better than the preceding terrorist government. You can see what's happening with the economy. You can see what's happening with this chaos in the street, with the muscadins. This violence hasn't stopped. This is very, very much whipped up when uh, Louis... Uh, the Comte de Provence, so the, the heir to the throne, the pretender to the French throne, which no longer exists anymore, of course, actually issues something called the Verona Declaration of June 1795. And we'll go on to talk about that in a moment. So 1795 sees three big uprisings, two of them very much influenced by the economic situation, and one of them very much influenced by the resurgency in royalism, which I've just been speaking about. So the first of these three uprisings of 1795 is the uprising of Germinal uh, in April 1795. And I think it's probably best to actually describe this as a demonstration rather than an uprising. Um, and what we see is 10,000 unarmed people marching on the, uh, on the convention and they have three demands. They want um, a return to the price fixing, the general maximum of Robespierre un un under the CPS in September 1793, August, September 1793. So they want increased bread 
They want a return to the previous constitution of 1793. They want to guarantee universal male suffrage. And they want the release of Barère, Colop, Debois, and Bilot Varenne, who had always been sympathetic towards the saint -Colot. These men, ironically, had actually overthrown Robespierre, but they themselves had fallen out of favour with the Thermidorians because of their extreme Jacobin sensibilities and obviously became targets of the White Terror and were imprisoned. So this movement tries to see their release. They expected that the remaining Montenard in the convention would join their plight, but they did not. Of course, many of the Montenard that still had survived the Thermidorian Revolution have, of course, become very quiet. They have abandoned their previous views, and they've tried to become as moderate as possible. Of course, they had to do that to survive. So they don't join in with the demonstration. They don't join in with the saint -Colot. And as a result, um, this demonstration is very easily dealt with. The National Guard, loyal to the Thermidorians, round them up. So I would argue that this is a huge success for the Thermidorians. The, the, they deal very well with this through moderate repression. Barère, Colot, and Bilovaren are deported at this point. They're sent to Guiana, which is often known as the dry guillotine colony. It's off the coast of South America. It's not like going on your holiday. Um, and also known activists were disarmed. So what they actually did was they marched into the Faubourg Saint-Anton, that region of northern uh, Paris, where many of the saint Colot uh, were based, and they went around the houses deliberately disarming them and, uh, you know, confiscating any weapons that they might have. But to no avail, because a month later, we see another uprising in May 1795. And this, I would call an uprising. It is much more serious. And it's actually very similar in scale to the storming of the Tuileries on the 10th of September 92, which, of course, um, overthrew the king. And it's also really similar to the overthrow of the Girondins in the sense that the saint Colot this time armed, surround the convention. And this is very, very serious. Um, it's an uprising for bread, so it's very, very similar to what motivated Germinal. Um, and of course, exacerbated by the continued economic situation and crisis. On the 22nd of May, the convention responds and rebe rebel suburbs were surrounded by 20,000 National Guardsmen who forced the demonstrators to give up their arms. Actually, although this is serious, it never ends in armed struggle. It actually ends in no shots being fired. The two sides negotiate, and this is really significant. This is the largest display of military force in Paris, arguably since this early Jeunesse of the French Revolution, and yet it ends relatively peacefully. The leaders, or presumed leaders, were rounded up. Um, any who had defected to the rioters were sought out. And later, it ends in severe repression. So on the day, not much fighting, but in the end, it actually does lead to severe repression. 40 Montanar were arrested, six are executed, again, many sent to Guiana, the dry guillotine. 6,000 demonstrators are arrested. And I just note the bold point here. Prairial marked the end of the saint -Colot as a military force. No longer would the saint -Colot be able to threaten or intimidate an elected assembly. And I think that's really important to understand. It's really important to draw a line under the saint -Colot as a as an influence in the French Revolution at this point in the summer of 1795. It's not just the uprising of Prairial, the systematic uprooting of the demonstrators, the confiscation of their weapons after Germinal. It's not just these things that rob the saint -Colot of their power. It's, of course, the fact that they no longer have any sympathy in the Montanars in the convention, who were, of course, hiding that they don't want themselves to be rooted out by this new Thermidorian government. And it's also due to the uh, machinery of the terror being torn apart. No longer do the saint -Colot wield any force. The commune, remember, has been completely destroyed. The final uprising is actually the most serious of the three. Largely royalist uprising, as opposed to the two saint -Colot uprisings of Germinal and Prairial. So the final uprising of 1795 is Vendemier. Um, and this very much comes after the Verona Declaration, which I mentioned earlier. So the Verona Declaration was issued by the Comte de Provence, Louis XVI's 
um, oldest younger brother who was next in line to the throne. And he issues this declaration basically saying he promised the French to take revenge on all the regicides if only they support the return to the monarchy. And of course, the big thing that he promises that many people in France back at this point is the end of war. At this point, there is serious war fatigue. The war has been going on since 1792. It's been escalated since 1793. The British have been blockading France, which has, of course, exacerbated the ongoing economic crisis since the summer of 1793. Many French just want to see an end to this. That being said, the Verona Declaration actually does fail to attract mass support for the Royalists. Um, not many people do turn out for them. But... The inability to deal with food shortages and inflation turned many against the against the Thermidorians. That should say not the Directory. The Directory doesn't yet exist, but it will it will exist soon. Um, so it is important to understand that this starts as a royalist uprising, but in the end it kind of takes on a similar visage to the earlier rebellions of 1795 in Germinal and Prairial. Many people, especially the Rentier. Small proprietors, petty bourgeoisie, the shopkeepers, were hit hard by the inflationary policy of the directory. So they join in the band of, of um, angry royalists marching through the streets of Paris. And I would argue that this is a success to an extent. A crowd of 25,000 gather to march and seize power and they are ultimately destroyed by Bonaparte. He puts down this rebellion, 25,000. He kills 300 of them. Uh, by firing these cannons, as you can see in the picture, in the very narrow streets of, of, of Paris. And what he does, which is especially gruesome, is he packs these cannons with what he calls grape shot. And this grape shot is just um, really sharp objects piled in to the normal cannon shot, which when fired is designed almost like a shotgun shell to, to spread and spray and to engulf the crowd in ballistics. Uh, so it's really, really horrible strategy that is used by Napoleon here, but it works very effectively. And the point that I just want to make here is an important one. The people of Paris would not again revolt until 1830. And that really sums up the period of the Thermidorians. Um, in summary, the Thermidorian period of 1794-5 saw a reaction against the excesses of the terror, politically and culturally, through, of course, the Muscadins, through the Incroyable, through the White Terror, but also through the dismantling of the machinery of the terror. The Thermidorian period of 1794-5 was also distinguished by those who tried to combine moderate politics with reprisals against old enemies, and the Thermidorian period of 1794-5 ultimately ended as the control of the Thermidorians was undermined by the resurgence of royalism and continued economic plight. So the Thermidorians aren't overthrown. They are successful in putting down these three rebellions in 1795, but they will now shift going forward into 1795. And we'll look at this next time when we look at the constitution of year five and the establishment of the directory, they would need to further legitimise their authority through the formation of a new constitution and government in order to cling to power.